Thank you, Dr. Carruthers, for informing us of environmental justice issues so close to home that take place at our border with Mexico. To continue our discussion of social conflict, we will now hear about human rights and extractive industries in Latin America. I would like to introduce Daniel Lopez Sequia, who will speak in place of Katia Salazar of the Do Law Process Foundation, who is unable to join us today. Attorney Lopez Sequieja is a human rights specialist for the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Since 2006, he has been in charge of evaluating requests for protection in the Office of Special Rapporteur for the Freedom of Expression. Mr. Lopez Sequieja has drafted various reports of the human rights situation in Bolivia and Peru. He has also recently become involved in an alteration of the Inter-American Commission's rules of procedure, policies, and practices. Attorney Lopez Sequia's publications include articles on international law, international human rights law, and international relations. Mr. Lopez Sequia holds a degree in law from the Federal University of Minas Gerais in international relations degree from the Pontifical Catholic University of Minas Gerais in Brazil. He earned his Master's of Law in International Legal Studies from Georgetown University and is pursuing a Master's of Science degree in Global Rule and Law and Constitutional Democracy program at the University of Genoa in Italy. Today, Attorney Lopez Sequia will address the mechanisms of inter-American human rights systems that have been employed to prevent and redress human violations against indigenous populations in the context of development projects. Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Lopez Sequia. Hey, good morning. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for being here. I'd like to thank the, those involved in the organization of this event. I can imagine how hardworking it has been for you in the past months or perhaps years. Um, my presentation is more close to uh, legal analysis, what's the legal uh, instruments that are, is available for indigenous peoples to confront uh, this kind of situation have been discussed for the past uh, two days. Uh, I tried to uh, touch some uh, aspects of other issues uh, beyond the legal discourse that can be of interest of those participating uh, in the center. Uh, I assume mostly those involved in uh, philosophy and social studies. Uh, first of all, a uh, dimension of, of uh, paradigms of justice in moral philosophy, uh, the classic concept of justice as a utilitarian approach as an aggregation, marginal aggregation of happiness or um, it's basically a liberal approach for justice. Uh, John Rawls made a huge critic on his theory of justice uh, and introduced the idea of justice as fairness. Um, and currently, the main paradigms it's on the table at stake is those supported by uh, Charles Taylor and uh, mainly Axel Honneth. Honneth is perhaps the last one in the Frankfurt uh, School that's trying to build a conception of a theory of justice based on justice as acknowledgement or recognition. It's highly influenced of the, uh, by the crisis of the multilateral discourse uh, in the post-capitalist societies. Uh, I, don't want to, to, I don't want to spend so much time, but if you have interest, I can provide more information uh, in the break for those who, who perhaps have interest and develop some research on these areas. Uh, the indigenous rights in Latin America and perhaps in the American continent uh, have faced uh, five stages in terms of constitutionalism. Liberal constitutions at uh, 19th century basically did not recognize indigenous peoples as a nation. Uh, the idea was uh, one state, one nation. Social constitutions, the first one in the world was the Mexican constitution of 1917, uh, introduced the idea of integration. The idea was to integrate uh, indigenous people to uh, the community uh, through social and economical rights. They basically consider indigenous population as uh, poor people, so they sh we should give uh, work to them without any consideration for their cosmo uh, cosmovision of their needs and their uh, demands. Uh, the International Labor Organization Convention of uh, number 169 somehow was adopted and influenced by this constitutional, uh, constitutionalist movement. Uh, 
that's the f uh, pluralist constitution. I would uh, somehow link the third to the fourth stage of constitutionalism in Latin America. Uh, Canadian Constitution 1982 was a benchmark, uh, inaugurated the debate on multiculturalism, and considered the indigenous popula population as a, a, a specific uh, community. And after the, this uh, constitutionalism uh, debate, the last stage we are uh, facing today is the plurinational state constitutionalism. Uh, the first one to introduce this idea was the Bolivian Constitution. Bolivia currently is called, the official name of Bolivia is uh, Estado Plurinacional de Bolivia, Plurinational State of Bolivia, and the Ecuadorian Constitution also adopt the same approach. They basically, basically consider indigenous people as a nation, and it has a, a very important uh, incidence on legal discourse. Just to give an example, these four items that has been developed since then. <coughs> uh, the UN Declaration of Indigenous Peoples' Rights of 2007, uh, somehow uh, portrays a lot of, of, of the constitutional debate that uh, is in place and has been adopted and believed in, in Ecuador. Uh, they inaugurate an impact between indigenous tribal peoples and the state, uh, consider indigenous people as political actors and owners of their territory. Uh, and particularly the last uh, point is important for the debate of this conference. A uh, new set of rights, for instance, buen vivir, that in English would be uh, something uh, could be translated as like uh, uh, good life or uh, welfare, and rights of nature. Both the Bolivian and uh, Ecuadorian constitution uh, mention this right. It's a unique right. You won't find it in any other constitution. Uh, but other uh, Congress and constitutional assembly are being influenced by this idea of uh, there is a set of rights that's not only related to human beings, but also to the nature. Uh, that was little discourse, and that's the reality in, in Latin America. Uh, Latin America is today the region uh, in which you f you'll find the higher levels of, of investment on mining projects, petrol, uh, any sort of extractive industry. Uh, along with Africa. Um, that's just some examples of the countries that has based their economy uh, into the extractive un industry, and in the right side, the effect of that. Uh, 161 uh, mining conflicts in the region. Uh, the data from the Observatorio Latinoamericano de Conflictos Ambientales, an organization based on Chile, have a, a very credible database on conflicts. Uh, related to not only to mining uh, investment, but also any sort of extractive industry. Um, growing po uh, police and military uh, activity to quell indigenous activists. I highlighted Peru because Peru is a, a, perhaps a, a laboratory to investigate this, this, uh, this trend of, of criminalization of indigenous leaders. Peru has faced a very complex history uh, there is a panel uh, after my presentation that will explain it a little bit, but just to brief, uh, the practice that dictatorship in Peru, the Fujimori government, employed to quell uh, the opposition, uh, to disappear uh, students' leaders, uh, has not been changed uh, whatever, uh, in, in, in any way, because it's being applied uh, by the extractive industries, uh, with the acknowledgement of the states. You have a lot of indigenous leaders being killed, uh, being harassed, and those who are participating in this kind of, 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 of illegal activities are closely linked to uh, the police and military forces. Uh, an example also in Peru, uh, 15 deaths from June 2011 and July 2012. Uh, July 2011, was a month uh, in, uh, in which uh, current president Ollantumala uh, took power in Peru. Uh, and he ran uh, his election through a discourse of um, more uh, democratic uh, dialogue with the indigenous community, the local communities, and so far we haven't uh, seen uh, many changes regarding other governments. One single event in June 2009 caused 34 deaths in Peru. <laughs> a confrontation between Amazon indigenous peoples with uh, uh, police officers. And that sounds uh, interesting that among those 34 deaths, 23 were uh, police officers. I can explain uh, 
in other occasion or further if you have doubts about those conflicts, the specificities, let me just move forward. Uh oh. I was supposed to have some pictures here. Uh, I don't know if you can help me, but uh, I would just, I was just uh, willing to mention um, an example of a fellow that I met two years ago. Uh, he's uh, in, a peasant leader in Cajamarca. Cajamarca is a province in Peru and right now the hottest spot in the country because there is a, a huge mining project. Uh, if uh, approved by the government, it will be the biggest one in the world. The company uh, that is trying to move forward the project is Newmont, is based here in Denver, Colorado. Uh, it's the biggest mining company in the world. In Cajamarca, has a symbolic uh, importance for the indigenous movement in Peru. Cajamarca was one of the capital of the Inca Empire. And this fellow that I met two years ago, I was, I was talking with him about what's the consequence with uh, the, the peasants community and the indigenous community decided to uh, just boycott the project and uh, the state comes with the army and the police as they used to do. And he said, uh, you know what, I'm, I'm, we're not afraid because the Spanish came here uh, 500 years ago and couldn't find our gold. And the Criollos uh, won't do neither. Criollos is a, a, a way of speaking, uh, talking about the white people in Latin America that heritage the, the Spanish tradition. <coughs> and he was mentioned, he used the word Criollos to mention Ollantumal or the, the government. And I, I didn't understand at the first uh, instance what, his, what he was talking about. And I did a survey and I found out that uh, there is a legend that says that when uh, the last Incan Empire, Atahualpa II, was kidnapped by Francisco Pizarro, the Spanish uh, commandant of the troops at the time, it was 1533, uh, he was kidnapped and he said to uh, Pizarro that he would give him uh, a room full of gold if he was released. And uh, Pizarro accepted the offer. Uh, uh, Atahualpa said to the Inca people, uh, just bring me the gold, we have enough, uh, gold and silver. And before that happened, uh, Pizarro ordered to kill uh, Atahualpa. The Inca population uh, knew about the, what happened and they thro threw away all the gold in a lake that should be showing, uh, that's El Paro Lake. Uh, and th that was the, the peasant leader was talking about. So we have the gold in the, our lakes and you don't want the mining company to come and take it back. The Spanish couldn't, and we're not allowed the government, the proven government, to do so. Uh, this picture will be the room where Atahualpa was kidnapped and kept uh, before being killed. Uh, and that will be a picture of what Janakosha Newmont Mining Project, they have already one project in, in, in Cajamarca going on, and that will be what happened after the project was uh, finished and what happened with the lakes that they have in Cajamarca. Uh, that will be a picture of Cajamarca people fighting for the lakes. And that's a little bit of legal, uh, legal discourse and where I work and uh, things I want to share with you. Uh, the Inter-American Human Rights Commission, uh, System is comprised by two organs, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights on the left, that's where I work. It's uh, located in Washington, D.C. Uh, was adopted uh, in 1959, that's all the information, uh, the relevant information. Uh, it covers the 35 American states, uh, including the United States, of course. Uh, it's also comprised by several instruments. The most important is the American Convention on Human Rights. The first one, the American Declaration on, on Rights and Duties of Men. So far, the United States has at fire zero instruments. Uh, for those who are interested in, in study law after uh, this undergraduate, uh, you understand that declarations uh, doesn't require any ratification. You just sign it through a general assembly. Uh, the United States has just signed the American Declaration on the rights and duties of men so far. The other, the other body is the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. It's located in San Jose, in Costa Rica, and it's uh, a judicial body. When the commission adopts a report finding violation of human rights, if the state do not comply with the recommendations, the, com the commission can say the case uh, to the court, and then the court issue a judgment. Uh, the legal source regarding indigenous people's rights, the main ones, the American Declaration, the rights and duties of men, and the American Convention on Human Rights. 
ILO Convention uh, 169 is the main uh, international instrument regarding indigenous people's rights, the first instrument to acknowledge the right to prior consultation for those projects of any economic activity uh, that can affect indigenous uh, territory. Uh, other international instruments, the, the most important is UN uh, Declaration of Indigenous People's Rights. It's an instrument of 2007. The United States did not sign this declaration, uh, but it was approved by a UN General Assembly. Uh, and other uh, relevant treaties and pronouncements, for instance, by the a Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, currently uh, is a U.S. citizen, James Amaya, who is in the University of Arizona. Um, that's the main sources of uh, indigenous people's rights in the Inter-American system. Uh, the Commission has issued uh, different country reports, uh, including country reports on Latin American countries, such as uh, Bolivia, Colombia, Peru, Venezuela, in which it uh, considered uh, subjects related to indigenous reports. The Commission has several thematic reports regarding uh, indigenous people's rights. Uh, the last one is specifically on the, the territory and indigenous people's rights. It's, uh, it's a report from 2010. Uh, and also a set of case laws and, 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 and jurisprudence that I'll mention a little bit, uh, the most important. Uh, very briefly, that's the main obligations regarding indigenous people's rights. Uh, historic use and possession uh, of the property systems as foundation of rights, pre-existence independent of state recognition. What do, does that mean? Uh, we've seen uh, in some cases, for instance, in a Nicaraguan case, that uh, states usually uh, present a defense before the commission saying that, we, okay, we authorize uh, this project uh, that affects indigenous people's territory because they didn't have the title. So they are not the properties. Uh, there is not, nothing uh, illegal uh, by doing that. And that's uh, completely wrong. Uh, the right of property regarding indigenous people is not related to a title, to a demarcation. It's basically related to tenure of uh, traditional or ancestral uh, occupation of the territory. Uh, and this uh, occupation, uh, place upon the state the obligation to delimitate, recognize, title, and registrate the territory. We see a little bit in, the, in a specific case. Uh, the rights of consultation and participation development projects, impacting resource, prior and informed consent for major projects. Um, ILO Convention 169 and most of the state's uh, laws and constitution in the continent, including the US uh, constitutional law, uh, consider that indigenous people has this right, uh, a right of consultation and participation, prior consultation and participation in any sort of development affecting their territory. And what's moving forward in the international uh, human rights law debate is the last part of, the, of this component of the prior consultation, is the prior informed consent for major projects. Uh, the UN Declaration of 2007 somehow mentioned this obligation. Some of the states consider that uh, it's not a binding instrument, so they uh, don't have to expect a consent by the Indigenous Committee, but rather uh, just uh, the consultation. Um, does, those international uh, human rights standards also impose to the state the duty of adapting domestic law, we'll see a little bit in the cases, uh, and a duty to adopt special and positive measures. This one, uh, very important case, perhaps the first one in which the Commission considered those uh, uh, issues. Uh, the Yanomami people uh, is uh, indigenous people uh, who lives uh, between the border of Brazil and Venezuela. Uh, in 1973, during the military dictatorship in Brazil, the government authorized uh, and built a highway through the ancestral land of this uh, community, uh, which brought uh, an influx of road constructors and geologists, miners, and sellers. Uh, it caused a lot of impact in terms of uh, health security, uh, a lot of social uh, problems, prostitution, uh, and uh, things related to, uh, to uh, exploitation, domination of, of those communi communities. Uh, the commission found that the state was responsible uh, 
for the violation of rights to life, liberty, and security, residence and circulation, uh, and preservation of health and welfare. After the decision, the commission uh, did a visit. That's the recommendation that the commission did at the time. The commission visited the, the territory in 1997 uh, when we adopted a report on Brazil, the general situation of human rights in Brazil. And uh, a delegation of commissioners, I forgot to mention that the commission is comprised by seven members, which one is of one different state. Currently, there is a, a citizen from the United States. It's Commissioner Dinah Shelton. She's a specialist on, 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 on environmental law as a professor in George Washington University. Uh, in 1997, the commission visited the region and found out that the territory had been demarcated and entitled. Uh, however, the exposure to contamination uh, regarding illegal mining and the presence of, of, of foreign, foreigners, persons not related to the community, uh, was still causing uh, environmental harm for this uh, community. Uh, that's a Nicaraguan case. Uh, I was staying in a community in Nicaragua. Uh, in this case, the community lacked the formal tidying of the property, so the state uh, concessed uh, uh, a project uh, that affected the territory. Uh, and found that the state was responsible for, for several human rights violations, such as the right to property, access to justice, uh, all protected on the American Convention on Human Rights. Uh, that's the only case in which a state complied uh, fully with the recommendation of the court, uh, and that is just one example of how the legal instruments are uh, available for the communities. It, this case was presented by a, by a local community. Uh, they was, they get, received advice from uh, UN uh, universities at the time, including the University of Arizona. Uh, James Anaya, who is the UN Special Rapporteur for Indigenous Peoples' Rights, uh, assessed the, the uh, advised the, the organization in Nicaragua. But it was a very successful litigation, and just an example of how university can integrate with local organizations in the countries, so can have uh, this kind of decision by an international body, and in the end, they have uh, basically uh, recovered their right to uh, their territory. Uh, this case, the, the case is fully compliant and disclosed before the court. That's some cases, a set of three cases in Paraguay. Oh. Paraguay has a huge problem related to uh, expropriation of territory uh, of the Guarani uh, people. Uh, it's in the Chaco region among the border with Bolivia, Brazil, and Argentina. You know that uh, Guarani is one of, of the official language of, of, of Paraguay. Uh, however, the situation of the Guarani people is one of the most dramatic in the continent, perhaps. Uh, so the three cases, the Sagunamaxa, Chamocasec, and Yakiaxa cases, uh, were three judgments uh, adopted between 2005 and 2009. Uh, uh, there's, those communities uh, were displaced by their territory, for, uh, by settlements, and, and deprived by their land due to state policy and land pr uh, privatization dating back to 19th century. Uh, in this case, the original uh, withdrawal of their territory uh, was in the 19th century, uh, and the court considered that even though so much time has passed, they had uh, ancestral rights or ancestral occupation of their lands. So the state had an obligation to recover their, this uh, occupation, to recover this, this right. Uh, right now, uh, that's what's going on in terms of compliance of the judgment. There is a, a big uh, political resistance to uh, give back these lands because most of the, of the land, land uh, holders are members of the Paraguayan Senate. They're politically very organized and very strong. They're basically the, those who control Paraguayan power uh, uh, in this, at this moment. However, some of, of the recommendations or the, of the, or the um, orders uh, issued by the court has been complied. So that's another example of how international uh, bodies and instruments can uh, provide uh, a way so that those communities can uh, claim their rights. What it says in, in red, in this sense, is propiedad privada, is proper, uh, private property. However, all those regions should be uh, uh, give back to, to those Agrani uh, uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, 
And to be very frank with you, I don't think that will happen because the state uh, has tried uh, for uh, at least five times since I'm in the commission, but the Senate has to approve the, the any, any sort of, of expropriation or, of, uh, or change of laws. And as I mentioned, the landlords are basically the ones who uh, are in power at the Senate at this time. And there's just some pictures of the, the communities uh, benefited by the judgment. That's another case of Saramaka people against Suriname. The Saramaka people are not an indigenous community. They are uh, Afro-descendant tribal community. International human rights law, uh, practically they have the same rights, the indigenous peoples and the uh, tribal uh, people. Uh, in this case, Suriname had granted a mining concession to third parties in an area within the traditional lands of Maroon. It's a Saramaka community. Uh, between 1997 and 2004. Uh, although Suriname was not part of the ILO Convention 169 that guaranteed the right to prior consultation, the court considered that it's also protected under other uh, international instruments. Uh, the court held that the state should have consulted the Saramacan community at the early stage of the development or investment plan. That's a very important precedent because we see, uh, for instance, in countries as Bolivia, uh, projects being uh, concessed or being approved by the administrative authorities. And when the, the project is running, uh, the state uh, starts the consultation with the communities. That's not considered to be uh, in compliance with the international standards. States should consult the indigenous people's uh, communities even before uh, deciding the project. Uh, any decision related to a project that affects indigenous territory uh, might be consulted at the first stage of the, of the procedures. Uh, and then it, it considered that state had a duty to obtain the consent of indigenous community whenever large-scale development plans would have a major impact on the community's territory. There's also a very important precedent that the first time the international body uh, expressly acknowledged the right to prior consent, uh, which is much more uh, protective than the prior consultation. The court did not dis uh, explain what large-scale development plans means, but uh, it gave some examples. For instance, mining projects, uh, petrol extractions uh, are uh, necessarily large-scale uh, projects uh, due to the effects that they have in the environment and the land of, the, of these uh, indigenous peoples. Um, that's the order that the court issued to the Sur Suriname uh, state. Uh, delimitate, demarcate, and grant collective title over the territory of the members of the Salamanca people in accordance with their customary law and through previous effective and full informing consultations with the Salamanca people without prejudice to other tribal and indigenous communities. Uh, legal recognition of collective judicial capacity, and that's an important component as well because in Suriname, uh, indigenous peoples and uh, tribal peoples were not considered to be, uh, to have judicial capacity. So the community as a whole could not uh, file an action against a state. Individuals could do so, but not a community considered as a collective. And the court uh, ordered the Suriname states to create a, a, a civil action or change uh, its law in order to a community as a whole, as a, a personhood, uh, can uh, file a judicial, uh, start a judicial procedure on their behalf as collective groups. And that's quite important regarding uh, property rights of indigenous community because the dimension of the property right is quite different than the individual property rights. The right of property is not, does not belong to individuals of the community. It belongs to the group as a whole. So even though one person wants to dispose of, the, of its property uh, and he, he or she is a member of indigenous community, uh, the state should consider the uh, ancestral way of, of disposing the, the property. In this case, uh, some of the members of the Saramaka people uh, sold their lands to, the, to mining companies, and they said, said that was illegal, that's fraudulent. It didn't have any legal effects. It should have consulted the community, the leaders of the community, and their traditionals to do this kind of a contract. Um, the third point is also, uh, the fourth point is also an important aspect. Adopt le legislative, administrative, and other measures necessary to recognize and ensure the rights of the Saramaka people to be effectively consulted. It means a uh, change of law. Uh, to ensure that the environment and social impact assessment 
are conducted by independent and uh, technically com competent entities pri prior to awarding a concession for any development of or investment project within traditional Saramaca territory. Um, for those who are familiar with international environmental law, uh, the International Court, Court of Justice has also considered uh, what is called in Spanish Estudio Impacto Ambiental, that's basically a uh, study of, of assessment of, of environmental impacts of projects is considered to be uh, an obligation under uh, international environmental law and since this decision under international human rights law as well. Uh, so it's a component of the indigenous type of right uh, since this decision. Uh, to adopt legislative, administrative, or and other measures necessary to provide the members of the Saramaca people with adequate and effective resource, again, acts that violate the rights to use and enjoyment uh, of property in accordance with their common property system. I have already uh, mentioned this aspect. Uh, the Quichua indigenous people of Sarayaco against Ecuador is a judgment of 2011. I had the opportunity to be in Ecuador, in Quito, last, the past October, the October of the past year. And I talked with some of the members of the Kitchen Indigenous. I'd like to, to mention a little bit of some political historical aspects of the, the quarrel between indigenous peoples and uh, Latin American governments. Ecuador has one of the most progressive constitution uh, in the world in terms of indigenous peoples' rights, as I mentioned. They uh, acknowledge the rights of nature. Uh, the assembly, the constitutional assembly, are comprised uh, mostly by uh, trade unions or um, uh, members and indigenous leaders. Uh, the former um, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ecuador was an indigenous leader, and she is currently a member of the Constitutional Tribunal. Nina Pacari is her name, she's a brilliant woman. Uh, just to, to, to give an idea of how the political discourse of Ecuador in countries with center left a trend has uh, used the indigenous discourse despite the economic uh, uh, policy of the state or the government are totally against indigenous people's rights. Uh, things getting every day more complex in, co and, and in countries like Ecuador and Bolivia, because indigenous peoples uh, has somehow changed their support to the government. Uh, Bolivia, specifically, I had the opportunity, I worked with Peru and Bolivia at the commission, I had the opportunity to talk with several uh, indigenous organizations and there have been happening some incidents of violence between government supporters, uh, mainly peasant organization, trade union organization, and the indigenous communities in several uh, parts of Bolivia, Cochabamba, Sucre, and even La Paz. Uh, so this case uh, somehow depicts this, this contradiction between uh, center-left discourse of support of indigenous people's uh, demands on one hand, and on the other hand, concessions to big uh, companies that affect indigenous people's rights and interests. Uh, this case uh, uh, goes back to 1992, when Ecuador awarded uh, a parcel of land in the Amazonian region uh, of approximately uh, to, to 250,000 hectares to, uh, that affect 28 communities of the Sarajaco people. It's a Quechua people. It's a Quechua community of, uh, of sorry, the, the Sarajaco is a community of the, of the Quechua indigenous people. Uh, and the concession uh, moved forward without any sort of prior consultation to the community. And they basically, uh, during the exp exploration, they threw uh, some sort of bombs uh, in the territory and mines. And children, uh, people that were uh, hunting or fishing, uh, se stepped eventually in those mines. And at least uh, dozens of them lost their lives uh, due to this exploration in their territory. Uh, and at the end, the, the government suspended the project. However, the company was not uh, obliged to take off all the minings, all the, 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 the implements that they were using that uh, are still affecting their right to integrity and in life. Uh, there have been uh, some other incidents of violence between the community and the army of Ecuador, including during the uh, Rafael Correa, who is the, the current president of, of the country. Um, and this uh, judgment, the court somehow amplified the right to consultation and made it more explicit. And the current case law of the Inter American human rights system is this one that you have in front of you. Uh, indigenous peoples must be involved in the process that may affect the territory where they live or other rights essential to their survival as a group. 
need for communities to be involved in all phases of the planning of the uh, development project. The right of indigenous people to be informed of potential benefits and risk of the project. State's duty to monitor the student impact in the, mental, the, the environment assessment. Uh, duty to consult according to indigenous customs and traditions. Prohibition of coercion against the community and its leaders. Duty to, demarcate, to demonstrate that it had uh, guaranteed the prior consultation. Consultation cannot be delegation, delegated in the same company interested in exploiting the resource in the territory of the community. And that's an important aspect because in some other uh, cases decided by the courts in the commission, the state usually uh, 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 alleged that uh, the consultation was made but with the, the, the company. And uh, uh, the company in, in some instances also is entitled to do the assessment of environmental impact. So this decision basically say uh, or establish that the, this assessment might be done by the state, by independent body of experts, not by the company. Uh, and also the consultation might be done by independent body of the, of the state, not, not by the company. Uh, and the last point, it should be conceived as a true instrument of participation that refers to the consultation. Uh, done in good faith, where there must be moral trust and with the goal of reaching a consensus. I remember a hearing that we had at commission uh, some years ago uh, regarding Brazil, and a community, a community was alleging that the consultation was not in accordance with the uh, uh, inter-American human rights standards, uh, and the state explained that they did uh, the consultation by means of, of some lectures that they gave uh, during uh, five days. Uh, and then the indigenous leader explained that, and showed pictures, uh, that the lecture was done in Portuguese, although the, the community uh, was not native, native in, in Portuguese, or at least most of its members and its leaders. And the assessment, the environment assessment study had 50,000 pages. How can you explain to indigenous community 50,000 uh, pages in other uh, language in five days? I cannot explain that. There should be also a picture here. Uh, this is a phrase of Patricia Gualinga, is a, she's a Sarayaku leader in the documentary I strongly recommend you to watch, is Screens of the Amazon. This word has not made analysis to decide whether oil is more valuable than what is lost by destroying the Amazon. Patricia Galinga is a superb woman, she's a Sarayaku leader. The picture will show uh, how, was, how she was Defender uh, defending uh, her territory before the Inter-American Court in San Jose, Costa Rica during the hearings. I had opportunity to know her uh, the past year when I was in, in Quito. And my participation in this seminar in Quito was an invitation by uh, the UN program on uh, women's rights related to indigenous peoples. It's quite interesting, that I, I assume that there are also some components of gender studies in the, in the center. How interesting is to see how uh, Women and mostly uh, leaders, uh, women leaders of the indigenous community, has their own demands, quite different than uh, men leaders. Uh, usually, men leaders uh, claim rights, traditional rights to territory, while uh, women leaders has also some gender components of domination and and and. Uh, discrimination not only by the authorities but inside their communities. So just to, if you have an interest, I can share some information on that. There are a lot of studies made by United, St by United Nations and also some uh, autonomous uh, agents of, of, of the OES. We have a commission, Inter-American Commission on Women at the Inter-American, uh, at the, the Organization of American States, and I can share this information uh, if, you're, if, you, if it is of your interest. So that's pretty much what I had to, to share with you. I open for questions if you have. I'm sorry to use a legal discourse. I know that's not very uh, chewable uh, discourse, but still, if you have any interest in other uh, components of my presentation, can provide you uh, during the break or whenever you can reach me. Thank you. In terms of compliance, uh, there is no coercion force by the Inter-American Court, no international uh, 
tribunal has the power, for instance, to uh, enforce their judgments through coercion. That's something that international law has not evolved uh, to that point. Uh, not even the International Court of Justice. In theory, a decision of the International Court of Justice can be sent to the Security Council. The Security Council can enforce it, but it has, haven't, haven't happened in the past. Uh, However, I can say that most of the judgment issued by the court are complied at least in part. Uh, indigenous peoples' uh, uh, cases mentioned here in my presentation, one of them is fully complied and the other ones are partially complied. Usually the demarcation, uh, the duty of demarcation would depend on the quality of democracy, uh, the political um, puzzle in, the, in each state, for instance, Paraguay was mentioning that landlords are, are very strong politically and they still command most of the Senate and, and the Congress in general. So it will depend on each country. Uh, but I can tell that there is a high level of compliance in all the judgments issued by the court. I, I, I think I forgot the first question. Who has standing to bring a complaint? Any person can bring a complaint. There is no requirement for power of attorney. You can bring a complaint on behalf of, of indigenous people if, you, if it is of your interest, any human being or organization. Yes? Um, the case in which the state is more resistant, it's hard to, 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 to choose one, to, to pick one. I would say, for instance, that Ecuador, surprisingly, is quite, was quite aggressive in their defense in the Sara Yaco case, although there should be some political support to indigenous movements because they uh, somehow constituted the basis of uh, the current government at the first moment. Uh, but now they're split and basically indigenous people's movements are doing opposition against uh, Korea's uh, government. Uh, but the defense was very aggressive and it's interesting also to see how uh, there is a, a very good article of Boventura Sosa Santos, he's a Portuguese sociologist, and he explained how the center left in Latin America adopts a, a very old fashioned discourse of, of uh, social rights at the same time that it has adopted policies that are the most controvers controversial in terms of indigenous people's rights. Uh, I would say that uh, countries such as Ecuador, uh, Bolivia has a, a very huge issue in terms of indigenous people's demands, Peru, uh, because it's not a center-left government, it's I would say a center or center-right government to Gentomala. Uh, the proven economy is totally based on mining uh, and this kind of, of, of activity, of extractive activities. And due to the history of Peru, uh, the social conflict is very present in the population. Uh, so it's also a country in which there is a huge uh, resistance on any sort of decisions taken by the commission, the court, regarding, regarding indigenous people's rights. I would pick perhaps those uh, three countries. Uh, Thank you very much.